I want to just take some lessons very quickly um, from the particular um, team that I was leading, which was the social science team, the social science team, which was concerned with vulnerability. The challenge for us was not so much how evidence had been used to tackle the health challenges, but what if there were no evidence to begin with? Um, and that's what we were worrying away with in terms of vulnerability. And I'm going to walk through that now. So the, the evidence, policies and programs are developed on the basis of what is already known. And that was really clear to us all as we were working on the program around policy relevant research and feeding research into policy during COVID. The work is conducted within government departments and parastatal bodies, as well as universities and within civil society. And as we're well aware, not only is it informed by colonial relations and the dominance of very particular northern literatures, and certainly that's true for social sciences and humanities, but it is also dominated by local norms and values. So typically what we don't know are people that fall outside of the purview of government for whatever reason. At the same time, what we've become, we were very aware of last year and this year is the way in which governance, governments balance their resources with pragmatic decisions in the context of urgency. And that is clearly the case for COVID, but it is also the case and will be the case for climate disasters and emergencies and increasingly with, with additional problems associated with um, global warming and it will follow um, on with new emerging pandemics including quite clearly um, AMR. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> lessons from the past. One of the things that informed us was our understanding of what vulnerability did and we were really um, concerned to tease out the relationship between vulnerability and human rights. But, and it was clear that relations of power and subordination play out, including under conditions of urgency. And I think that um, both Joel and Nora brought this out really well. And all crises have these basic conditions, I believe. So this includes um, the way in which any disease, but I'd also say any crisis or any urgent um, or or disruption in, in, in social life, any of these is felt more intensely because in particular sectors of society, because of the way in which it exploits pre-existing vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities amplify the effects of infection and in the case of a health crisis or amplify the effects of a disaster. And the disaster amplifies the effects of vulnerability. So there is a correlation between the two. And that is um, always the case. Sorry, I'll just flick back on this. But at the same time, states are limited to what they're able to do, which is the importance of ensuring policy um, relevant information is flowing into states in order to support decision making in the best possible way that does not further marginalize or render vulnerable or render lives precarious for populations. But also prior tensions and divisions are sharpened in crises and we are very well familiar with that everywhere. So one of the, the, the um, ways in which I've been interested in unpicking this is the way in which the unintended consequences of the initial responses to the pandemic expanded vulnerability and led, this is a photograph um, from South Africa of food queues. The measures that were undertaken by government were always built upon measures that were already there so that the lives that were to be saved were lives that were known that of people who were registered, for example, and people who had access to services and the livelihoods that became a focus of intention and particularly from late last year were the livelihoods of people who were 
known to be employed in formal employment settings, not so much people who were so marginal as to always be operating under the radar. So somebody without papers, for example, who was regarded as, in quotes, illegal, somebody who was working on the margins of the law or was acting unlawfully, drug selling, for example, would never be included in the range of actions that would be taken to minimise risk for these populations. So the mechanisms of care um, that were operationalised and from the work that we did within the RN program, this was true across most countries on the continent that acted with speed in response to COVID. The, the, the action was firstly to draw on the mechanisms already used. So the evidence was not new evidence. It was evidence that was entrenched in policies and programs. People were concerned and very early on about changes in wages and loss of employment. And in many cases, and that did include Kenya, it did include, I think, to an extent, Uganda, Nigeria, certainly South Africa. So social grant systems were topped up. New grant systems were introduced. Very early on, people became aware of um, markers of social distress, such as those that impacted upon women and to a lesser extent on children. But again, a large portion of the population fell outside of this. So the report itself emphasized, our report, our section, emphasized human rights and interdisciplinary disciplinary perspectives. And I think that this really um, echoes with, 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 with maybe a more tangible and pragmatic bent rather than sophistication of Joel's comments, but it is the same issue around the need to, take, to understand what populations are engaged with and what kinds of perspectives are required and what kind of um, methodological tools might be needed to reflect upon risks and vulnerability, precariousness and social exclusion. So we concluded that COVID acknowledges longstanding inequalities, that population responses are required to address these root causes of vulnerability, but also, of course, what happens under a crisis is that it's too late to address the root causes anyway. And, and so there is, I think, a, an insistence that needs to come from the science community across all the sciences to go back to these root causes rather than to always be scrambling towards the end of a crisis when we realise who has been left out and who is not being responded to. So just in summary here, the social inf effects of infection and lockdown, and here I'd also want to say the social effects of any disaster is felt hardest by people who are vulnerable or dependent. And those vulnerabilities and dependencies includes people at either end of the life scheme, um, life cycle, not people who are, who are of working age, but the people who rely on them. It includes people um, who have um, non-normative, if you like, capabilities, and that includes people living with a range of disabilities, people who are already isolated, people in congregate settings, and I don't only mean jails, but I think that for the most part, out of discomfort, many of us avoid um, the attention that maybe we should be placing on orphanages, Age res well, age residency's got a good run with COVID because of the differential mortality, but refuges, um, congregate settings that have been forced through homelessness of overcrowding people in, um, in informal settings, living under bridges and in sewers. People who um, lack papers, such as many people who are informal, I guess, refugees, but other people who are entirely outside of who we would, we would regard as citizens or are excluded or actively discriminated against. And in this group, I think we have to include sexual minorities, sex workers, people who 
use drugs and as uncomfortable as it might be, we also have to include people who rely on selling drugs for their work, but garbage pickers, um, recyclers, other kinds of people um, who are part of the fabric of social life, even when it is contradictory to the social norms of any government or, or our own value systems. So what I'm going to conclude with is the need to learn from past mistakes and successes um, to reinforce the point that strict lockdown saved lives, um, but it didn't necessarily protect the people whose lives were seen to be um, on the border or out of anyone's um, ambit. Um, lockdowns was a blunt tool causing major side effects downstream and the, we are now facing long lasting implications as a result of that, although I don't believe that there was a necessary choice in that. What I do think is that we do need multiple criteria for pandemics and policy making and need to be able to act in that regard. So my apologies if I've gone over time and I didn't have my, you can now see that I'm actually here. That was not a recorded voice.